All right. Today we're going to talk about chapter six, which is sensation and perception. And this chapter is kind of a long chapter, so there's quite a few parts to it. But starting off, sensation. Okay. Psychophysics is the area that studies how physical stimuli from the environment are perceived by the brain. This basically breaks down this definition of psychophysics. Sensation is using our senses to detect a physical stimulus. For example, coldness of temperature, or hotness, or touch, or what we hear, or what we see. And then perception is the interpretation of the stimulus. So basically, all of us use our senses to detect things from the environment, but what we interpret, or what we detect, is often seen in perception, and that's how we perceive things. So everyone will use their eyes to look at a wall, but everybody will interpret what they see on that wall a little bit differently. Now, in terms of a good question, sensation refers to, and you always will see, as you're kind of looking over the answers, detection is always another name for sensation. It's what you detect from the environment. So the answer for that one is letter A. Now, in the process of sensation, okay, and this is set up you know, in the PowerPoint to kind of explain how our brain basically perceives information, but everything starts off with an accessory structure, and this is a part of a sensory organ. For example, it's the lens of the eye, it's the outer ear of the ear, and it's responsible for collecting and modifying energy from the environment. So an accessory stru structure basically is what captures okay, the physical energy from the environment. Now, from there, sensory receptors, which are specialized cells, which are similar to neurons, but they don't have dendrites or axons that respond to certain energy fluctuations in the environment that exceed the threshold. Now, eventually this causes an action potential. So when something from the environment is strong enough to exceed the threshold, it basically starts the chain in terms of energy being released in order to detect that energy. Now, transduction is a key word here. and You'll see questions on this throughout the course. Transdu transduction occurs in the brain, which basically converts physical energy into neural code. Okay, the brain has to understand things in a neural type of way, or it's just simply not going to make things. So transduction takes the energy from the environment and converts it into what the brain is going to understand. Very similar to what a computer does. A computer uses a conversion basically taking whatever you type and putting it into a binary code of zeros and ones. Now, information is then sent from the sensory receptors via the sensory nerves to the central nervous system. Remember the central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord. Now, all sensory information except smell is then sent to the thalamus in the brain. The thalamus is like the secretary of a building. It tells people where to go once they enter the building. So all sensory information goes to the thalamus and then it's relayed to different parts of the brain, which then it's going to be perceived and interpreted and give us a thought. Now, the sensory cortex, which is located in the parietal lobe, okay? Now remember the parietal lobe is at the top part of the brain, dog, dog, goose, that's touch. The, soma, or the sensory cortex, also referred to as the soma uh, to sensory cortex, processes sensory information. So it's located within the parietal lobe. Now, after that, energy from the environment is only detected if it's strong enough to trigger an action potential. Okay? Now, in terms of whether or not it's strong enough, it has to exceed the absolute threshold. So we're basically just adding the word absolute to threshold, which threshold for chapter two is the minimum amount of level of stimulation necessary. So once something is strong enough and it exceeds the absolute threshold, then simply an action potential can take place and that's when simply the brain starts to you know, process the information. If it's too faint, all right, which we prefer to as subliminal, then basically it comes in under the absolute threshold and the point is then action potentials don't you know, get triggered and information is not interpreted. Now where you see 50% of the time, sometimes that throws kids off. What that accounts for is most of the time we're not paying attention to things in our immediate environment. So that's why it says 50% of the time. There are things that are strong enough to exceed the absolute threshold, physically speaking. Okay, Physi or loud, It's loud enough, but if we're not paying attention to it, then it's not going to trigger any type of you know, brain activity. Now, signal detection theory okay, is a mathematical formula that simply determines when people report the detection of a stimulus. Now, this takes into consideration two other factors. One is sensitivity, the ability to detect the stimulus, which is affected by the strength. So that's your absolute threshold. So if it's not strong enough to exceed the absolute threshold, 
No brain activity is going to take place. The other part is response criterion, which I was referring to as the 50% of the time. This is a person's willingness to respond to a stimulus, the motivation. Sometimes in the class, I'm talking loud enough where you can hear me, but if you choose not to listen, then basically it's like if I called on you, you have no idea what I just said for the last couple minutes. Even though my voice was strong enough, it was enough, in other words, it was above the absolute threshold, because your motivation wasn't there when I was talking, you didn't register any thoughts in your brain. Now, some, you know, this is kind of just on the side of four possible outcomes that are often you know, arise from the signal detection theory is HITS is simply refers to the detection of a stimulus when present. So in other words, you're able to hear it, okay? MISSES is failure to detect the stimulus when present. And this is kind of connected to the response criterion. When you miss it, even though I was loud enough talking, because you weren't motivated to listen, you missed, you know, simply when you heard the beep or whatever else. False alarms is the belief or detection of a stimulus that is not present. So you think you heard something, but when in fact you didn't hear anything at all. Now, correct rejection is not being able to detect a stimulus that is absent. Okay? So all four of these, a lot of times they use them with hearing tests, for example. You'll hear a beep, and then when you say, yes, I heard the beep, that's a hit. A miss is failure to detect a stimulus when present. False alarm is simply the belief or detection of a stimulus that is not present, so you think you heard a beep. And then correct rejection is not being able to detect a stimulus that is absent. Now, on the next part, difference threshold, it's also called just noticeable difference, is the smallest detectable difference between two stimuli. So I often use kind of an example, Pepsi versus Coke. There's not much of a difference between those two in order for you to detect it. So what that means is it doesn't exceed the difference threshold. So if you were able to tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi, then there's enough of a variation okay, between the two which what that means is it exceeds the difference threshold. Now, a couple other factors that roll into the difference threshold. Okay? Weber's law suggests that the difference threshold depends on the strength of the new stimulus in relation to the original stimulus. This is one that confuses people. Okay? So I use kind of an example. If you are holding 20 pounds, a feather placed on top, you're not going to be able to detect the difference. Because why? the new stimulus is not in relation or proportionate to the original stimulus. It's not of the same type of caliber or the same type of weight. Okay? But if you place 10 pounds on top of the 20 pounds, because that's more in proportion to the original stimulus, okay? the new stimulus of 10 pounds is more in proportion to the original stimulus, then you're able to detect a difference. So a similar like this, if you go to a concert, before the band comes out, okay, if you're talking to the person next to you, there's enough of a difference between your voice and the background voice. Okay, It's in proportion. But once the band comes in, unless you start talking louder, your friend's not going to be able to tell the difference between your voice or what you're saying and the background noise of the band. So you have to compete with the original stimulus, which is the band. So the new stimulus, your voice, has to be louder or as loud as the band playing. Now, Gustav Fechner studied Weber's Law in terms of intensity, and he kind of added a few things to it. A soft sound only requires a minimum increase. So if everybody's whispering, and you talk a little bit louder, the intensity of your voice is going to be detected, okay, in terms of a difference between the two. Now, if a loud sound, then a big increase would be necessary. So if the whole class is talking, I would have to talk louder, okay, in order for them to hear my voice over everybody else in the classroom. Now, Fechner's law basically says continuous increases of physical energy will, small, will result in smaller increases in perceived magnitude. And what that means is, simply, if you turn up the stereo slightly over the course of, let's say, five minutes, those slight increases in volume, nobody's going to tell that the music's getting louder. But if you all of a sudden turned it up from 10 decibels to 30 decibels, then everybody's going to be able to tell the difference because the intensity was simply a big increase. Now, on the next part, sensory adaptation occurs as our sensory receptors. Okay, remember sensory receptors are specialized to detect changes in the environment. Lose their sensitivity in response to an unchanging stimulus. Now, classic example of sensory adaptation. If you jump into a pool, at first your sensory receptors are reporting the temperature change, which is obviously, when you're in a cold pool, very uncomfortable. But as you stay in the water, which is an unchanging stimulus, the water temperature is not changing, 
you lose the sensitivity okay, of your sensory receptors. In other words, you adapt. And that's why you're not able to detect that the temperature of the water is as cold. But if somebody falls in 20 minutes later and jumps in, while you're saying the water is fine because your senses have adapted to it, this person is noticing a big change in terms of the temperature because their senses haven't adapted yet to it. Now, good question here. When Sue first went outside, she found the cold unbearable. She complained how cold it was, but after a while, the temperature did not seem to bother her. Which sensational process allowed Sue to tolerate the cold? Now, most of you, as you're kind of looking, in other words, you would said her senses adapted to the cold. And again, the temperature outside didn't change. She just, her senses simply diminished in sensitivity because they adapted. Now, the visual system, which is pretty much our dominant sense, most of the information we take into our brain is coming from our eyes. Now, how this is highlighted is a step-by-step -step procedure. Okay, and I underlined all the major components or parts of the eye. But first of all, the visual process begins with light passes the cornea, which is a clear protective membrane that covers the eye, protects the eye. Now, light then passes through the pupil, the opening in the eye that allows light to enter, which is controlled by the iris, which the iris is the colored portion of your eye. That's a muscle. The iris is a muscle that basically opens or constricts okay, the size of the pupil. So the pupil is just the opening, but the iris controls the size of the pupil. Now, the lens, which is located behind the pupil, bends the light, way focusing on the retina through the process of accommodation. So the lens focusing in and out of the object, all right, just like the lens of a camera. And you simply kind of focus in and out until the object looks clear. And that's exactly what your lens is doing, and that process is called accommodation. Now, the retina, which is located in the back of the eye, this is where transduction takes place. Now, remember, transduction is converting physical energy into neural code. Now, Within the retina, retina are photoreceptors. These are the sensory receptors. Now, they are specialized cells that are simply going to be activated when they see light waves. All right, and you'll notice that each one of our senses has different types of receptors that are built to only detect certain things. So, photoreceptors are not going to detect okay, audio waves. They're going to detect, basically, light waves. Now, rods and cones are the photoreceptors. Now, rods are activated in dimly lighted conditions, black and white types of conditions, shades of gray in our peripheral vision. So in other words, they get turned on when the lights get turned off. All right, they become active. Now, our cones, which are more active in bright lights, okay, color vision and fine details, are located in the fovea. And the fovea is in the center part of the eye. That's why when we're trying to look at something, we don't hold the object to our side. We hold it right in front of us try to figure out what it is because that's where we're able to detect fine details and that's what cones are responsible for. The rods are located more towards the peripheral of the retina and that's why they're used you know, to detect peripheral vision to the right or to the left of us. Now, bipolar cells are specialized neurons that connect the rods and cones to the ganglion cells. So the bipolar cells are like a bridge okay, between the sensory receptors and the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are specialized neurons that receive and process information before it's sent to the brain. Okay? So they basically label it all right, from what the rods and cones are being able to be activated in terms of what they detect. Now, the axons, which is the sending part of a neuron, okay, the axons of the ganglion cells form the optic nerve. And remember, a nerve is a bundle of axons. Okay? So strings are like axons, and when you put them together, you get a rope, and a rope is like a nerve. Now, the optic nerve carries information to the brain. Now, the optic disc is an area of the eye that contains no rods or cones, which is where the optic nerve is attached. So the optic nerve is attached to the back. Where it's attached to the back of the retina, there are no rods or cones. Now, this produces what we call a blind spot in the visual field. But because we have two eyes, we never notice this blind spot. One eye accommodates for what the other eye can't see. Now, the optic chiasm, chimes like an X refers to the point where the nerves from each eye meet in the brain and then cross to the opposite sides. So the left side of the retina is simply sending information to the right side of the brain. And the right side of the retina is sending information to the left side of the brain. Okay, It's not the right eye goes to the left or the left eye goes to the right. It's simply the left part or the right part goes to the opposite side. Now, 
Information is then sent to the thalamus. And remember, the thalamus is the relay center. It's the secretary of the building that tells everybody to go what, where, once they enter. Now, this is re relayed to the primary visual cortex. And this is the area that processes visual information. Now, that's located in the occipital lobe, DOC, OI can see. Now, there are something called feature detectors, which are specialized neurons that respond to certain sizes, shapes, and angles, which are located within the primary visual cortex. So they are basically what are putting together the pieces of the puzzle, because they notice little parts of it. Now, optic chiasm, good question here, responsible for color vision, where the optic nerve leaves the eye, where the optic nerve crossover. Remember, chiasm means X, so crossover would obviously be your key thing there. So the answer is C, okay? Now, in terms of color vision, hue refers to the color that people psychologically experience, red, green, blue, and so on. Now, hue is determined by the length of the wave. Short wavelengths, okay, which that, what I mean by short wavelengths, the peak of one wave to the peak of another, the distance between those two, okay? Short distance refers to bluish colors. Long distance between those waves is going to refer to reddish colors. Now, in the between, you know, medium wavelengths is more of your greenish colors. Now, how you remember this is remember short, shortish, short wavelengths produce bluish colors like Smurfs. Long wavelengths produce reddish colors like Clifford the dog. And then leprechauns, which are green, are kind of in the middle. And that is simply a middle wavelength, okay, in terms of distance. Now, saturation refers to the purity of the color. Red is richly saturated because it's comprised of one wavelength. Pink is not as rich of a color, okay, as red, because pink's the combination of a lot of different wavelengths, okay? So when there's only one wavelength, that's when you're going to have the most purest color. Now, brightness refers to the intensity of the light wave, which is the height or the amplitude. So the taller the wave, okay, the brighter it's going to be. The shorter the wave, the duller the color is going to be. So if you have, let's say, a bright red color, what you're going to see is the length between two waves very long, and you're going to see very tall waves. Okay? If you have a bright blue color, you're going to see basically two waves kind of close together, but very tall. Now, in terms of color mixing, subtractive color mixing occurs by mixing different paint colors. So if you ever take a bunch of paint and dump them into each other and stir it, you're going to see different colors appear. Now, a stop sign is red because it absorbs certain wavelengths. So if you mix a bunch of colors into red, you're still going to have red because those colors get absorbed and you're left with red. Black results is simply the result of all the wavelengths being absorbed. Okay? A prism reflects wavelengths. So if you ever looked at a clear prism, it reflects all the different wavelengths. And some people have those annoying things on their car. Okay? Additive color mixing, adding, adding wavelengths can produce colors. Red, green, and blue added together produces white. Okay? Now, theories of color vision, and you're going to see two predominant ones. Thomas Young and Herman Van Holmes believe that people have three types of receptors. Okay? Three types of cones, basically. Each responsible to different wavelengths. So in other words, each gets activated to either long, medium, or short blue uh, wavelengths. Now, these three, three types of cones, green medium, red long, blue short, can produce a variety of colors. If you look at the old projection TVs, they got three bulbs in the back, okay? A red, a green, and a blue. And when they're you know, simply turned on at certain times, when they're being activated, they can produce all different types of colors. So this is basically the three types of cones mixing together, producing all different types of colors. Now, people who are colorblind, red, green color blindness, for example, most common have a defective or a defective red or green cone. Okay, that means it's not turned on. Now, the other theory of color vision was proposed by Ewood and Herring, and this proposed the opponent process theory, and that color sensitive components of the eye are grouped into three pairs: red, green, blue, yellow, black, white. Each member inhibits or shuts off the other. So, in other words, when you see red, green is turned off. When you see blue, yellow is turned off. Okay, now. Like I said, when red is on, green is off. Now when you look at this part right here, color is the result of certain colors being on and certain colors off. So purple is the result of red on, red and blue on, and green and yellow off. So again, most people do not say or describe something as reddish-greenish or bluish-yellowish. They either see blue or they see yellow.
Okay, they don't see them at the same time on an image. Now, this theory and sensory adaptation explain the occurrences of after images, which you'll probably get a question on. When you stare, okay, at a red dot, if you were to look away, what happens is you will see a green dot. Partly because what happens when you stare at a red dot, remember the definition of sensory adaptation. Your senses simply lose their sensitivity to an unchanging stimulus. So by looking at a red dot over you know, a period of time, you're simply losing the sensitivity to the color of the red. Well, you're turning off red, and then when you look away, you're going to see green. So you basically, you exhaust your red, and it turns on the green. And that's why we see an after image. And it's the same thing with blue and yellow and black and white. Now, in terms of hearing or audition, sound is continuous changes that occur in pressure of air, water, or other substances, which we call mediums. Now, when a sound wave strikes a medium, like when a sound wave hits a wall, basically, it, it creates a vibration that results in sound. Now, this is why you cannot see through a wall, okay, because light waves cannot travel through mediums or objects. But sound waves can travel through mediums. And when they travel through mediums, it causes different vibrations. So hearing me talk here would be different if you were underwater. Because when I'm talking, my voice is going to hit the medium, which is the water, and it's going to change the vibration, which is going to change the interpretation of sound. Just like if you were standing outside my classroom, my voice will sound slightly different. Because when my voice hits the medium of the door, it's going to change the vibrations from the complexity of sound. Now, Pitch refers to the highness and lowness of a sound. Now, the height or amplitude of a sound wave determines the loudness. So again, it's very similar to a light wave. The taller it is, that was the brighter the color. The taller it is with audition, the louder the sound, Okay, which is measured in decibels. Now, anything above zero decibels, that's the absolute threshold we can hear. Now, a soft whisper is under 10 decibels. But you go to a concert, you're talking 100 to 200 decibels. That's why your ears hurt after you go to uh, you know, that type of uh, atmosphere. Now, frequency is the number of complete waves that pass through a medium. So sound waves travel through a medium, and the frequency refers to how, when they travel through that medium. Now, timbre is the purity of the sound. Okay? It's kind of what we're interpreting the sound as. Okay? And this is basically the combination of sound waves. Now, the height of a sound wave determines the pitch. The frequency, the timbre, the loudness, or transduction. And most of you said D, loudness, as the same thing as brightness. Now, in terms of the parts of the ear, the outer ear, which is that's your accessory structure, just like the lens was, you know, the accessory structure for you know light, the outer ear is what collects sound waves. Okay? Now the pinna is the visible outer part of the ear. Okay? That's the funny thing located on the side of your head. The auditory canal is simply channels the sound waves to the eardrum. The eardrum is a membrane that vibrates in response to incoming sound waves. And how the eardrum basically vibrates is going to depend on the frequency of the sound wave coming in. Okay. Now, the middle ear, which is the mechanic part of the ear, is made up of three tiny bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So if you remember, the middle ear has hammer, anvil, stirrup, three tiny bones. Now, each bone causes the next bone to vibrate resulting in increased amplitude. The point of these bones is to amplify sound onto the oval window, which separates the middle ear from the inner ear. They're like three little tiny pistons that are going to amplify simply the frequency of the sound wave coming in. Now the inner ear, this is where our transduction takes place. This is very similar to the retina okay, of the eye where transduction takes place. The cochlea literally looks like a snail. okay, And the floor or the lining of the cochlea is the best base of their membrane. It literally is like a carpet. Now, this carpet or base of their membrane contains hair cells. Okay, these hair cells are called cilia. Now, these are the sensory receptors for audition, just like rods and cones or the sensory receptors for vision. Now, these sensory receptors are activated when sound waves basically channel into the inner ear. Now. The auditory nerve carries message to the thalamus, remember the relay center of the brain, which then sends information to the audio cortex, which is located in the temporal lobe. Remember the temporal lobe is on the side, temple of the beat. Okay? Now, vibrations from the oval cause the fluid in the cochlea to move. This causes the carpeting to move. 
When the carpeting starts to move because the cilia or hair cells are attached to it, the more they move, the more an electronic impulse is set up the auditory nerve, which basically that nerve impulse is going to allow us to perceive or interpret what we hear. Now, good question here. Blank are the receptor cells for audition, and blank are the receptor cells for vision. That's a typical question you can see on the national exam. Now, hair cells or cilia are the receptor cells for audition, and most of you probably remember rods and cones are the receptor, sensory receptors for vision. Now, theories of audition, the frequency matching theory, it's also called the volley principle, states that the vibrations of the basilar membrane are determined by the frequency of the vibration. High frequency causes bigger vibrations within the basilar membrane, which simply accounts for you know, hearing a loud pitch sound. Volley principle states that when neurons fire as a group in rapid succession, it makes us possible to hear higher frequencies, okay, and that's important. Now the place theory suggests that pitch, or what we hear, comes from where simply the vibration hits the base of the membrane. If it hits in the middle, it's going to cause a different type of sound. If it hits at the end, or at the other end of a base of the membrane, it's going to cause a different type of sound. This one is literally like if you take car, you know, a rock and you shake it. Okay, the more you shake it, the more dust comes up. So the more this moves, according to the frequency matching theory, the louder the sound. Place theory is like playing a guitar. Where you put your fingers on the chord is going to produce a different type of sound. Okay, now, in terms of hearing loss, conduction hearing loss occurs when either the eardrum is punctured or the three tiny bones in the middle ear are damaged. This can often be corrected with a hearing aid. Okay, because a hearing aid, basically, when you look at it, when you turn up a hearing aid, it amplifies the sound. That's exactly what the middle ear does. So sensory neural hearing loss occurs when there's damage to the inner ear, specifically the hair cells or the auditory nerve. Now, unless they get a cochlear implant, okay, they're really, for a lot of times, when you have sensory neural hearing loss, it's often permanent. Okay, conduction hearing loss a lot of times happens as you get older, just wear and tear, okay, to your middle ear because it's working so much. Okay, now, smell, the next sense we're going to talk about is referred to as olfact olfaction. So just remember olfactory smell, it's a good way to remember it. Taste and smell are both chemical senses. Now, molecules enter the nose where olfactory receptor cells, okay? Those are the sensory receptors that are responsible for, you know, detecting odor or molecule, odor molecules. Now, they're located within your nasal lining. Once a receptor cell is stimulated by a smell, Okay, the axons converge with the olfactory axons forming the olfactory ner nerves. The olfactory nerves carry the information to what's called the olfactory ball. Remember, smell doesn't go to the thalamus. It goes to the olfactory ball. Now, that's located at the end of the olfactory cortex, and that's responsible for the sensation of smell. Now, from the olfactory ball, information is then sent to the temporal lobe, where the recognition of smell and the limbic system, where the emotional significance is associated. Remember the limbic system is comprised of the amygdala, the charge of emotion, the hippocampus, the charge of memory. That's why smell often triggers memories, because it, it, the information is being sent to the limbic system. So the hippocampus is being activated. Now, sensory adaptation for most senses occurs over an extended period of time. But smell, okay, because it direct, goes directly to the brain, happens very quickly. So in other words, you often will adapt very quickly to a foul odor where when a person walks in following you five or ten minutes later, they'll say, what stinks in here? You've already gotten used to it. Now, all sensory information is sent to the thalamus except, and most of you I'm sure can remember what I just said, and that is letter E, smell. Now, taste is referred to as gustation. That tastes disgustation. Okay, it's a good way to remember. Now, taste buds are the sensory receptors that are activated when substances enter the mouth. Okay? Now, the five types of taste buds, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, which is activated with protein-rich foods like chicken. That's why most people will say, if they can't figure it out, they say it tastes like chicken. Okay, because probably why they're saying that is whatever they ate has a high concentration of protein. Okay, now, taste buds are located unevenly through the mouth, okay, in the tongue, in groups called papillae. Now, taste buds regenerate about every two weeks, but if you smoke and drink, can cause permanent loss. People that smoke and drink for a long period of time will often lose the sensation of taste. And usually, because smell and taste work together, both are going to be affected. Now, 25% of the population 
are considered what we call super tasters. These are people who have a large number of taste buds, and they can detect quite a bit of uh, variations that you and I cannot. These are you know, often wine tasters, food critics, things like that. Now, non-tasters are people who have a smaller number of taste buds, and that you know, is often you know, from a number of factors. Somewhat, they could have been born that way. Now, sensory interaction occurs when one sense influences the other sense. Smell and taste, okay, are example of sensory interaction. Now, insomni occurs when a people is unable to distinguish between different smells, which also, because of sensory interaction, results in an inability to distinguish between different tastes. And there are some people that, you know, have insomni where they cannot taste or they cannot smell things. Now, another good example of insomni. Now, this is, insomni is permanent, but for some people when they get a cold, obviously they can't smell, but they often will notice they can't, you know, taste as well. That's why I've heard example of sensory interaction. Some people, when they smell something, they smack their lips and they, can, they say they can almost taste it from smelling it. And they're actually right. Now, synesthesia is a rare phenomenon where people experience odd interaction of the senses. A person may be able to feel a color or taste a shape. And then, like I said, it's very rare. They've done case studies, which again are a rare or you know, typically one or two people being studied. Now, the body senses. The body are somatic. Somatic means body includes touch, temperature, and pain. Now, your skin is the largest sense organ in the body. Now, lips, fingertips, and the face have the greatest number of sensory neurons, which is why you're most sensitive. If you get a paper cut on your lip, or on your face, or on your finger, you're going to feel it. Where you have the least amount of sensory neurons is your back, legs, and arms. That's why if you get a little cut to your back, okay, or you get a pimple on your back, a lot of times you don't know it's there until you see it with your eyes. Now, pantheon corpuscles are located beneath the skin, and they detect touch and pressure. It's comparable to a spring. That's what they look like. And when the spring gets compressed, a signal gets sent to the brain that you're being touched. Okay? The more it's compressed, the more you're going to feel, basically, the touch, and often you know, you know, resulting in pain. Now, sensory adaptation helps handle constant pressure. For example, putting glasses on. Okay, at first you feel the glasses on because the pantheon corpuscles are being compressed. But again, when they're being compressed, since it's an unchanging stimulus, the glasses sit on your face, eventually you lose the sensitivity to the weight of those glasses. Now, the body senses with temperature. There are receptors that detect temperature, which include warm and cold. There is no hot. Okay? The sensation of hot is the result of the warm and cold being stimulated at the same time. People will often say frostbite burns because you're stimulating the cold receptors, but when you walk inside, the warm receptors from the warm temperature of your house are being activated at the same time. When these two are activated at the same time, it burns. Okay? Now, pain is necessary for survival. No one likes it, but you need it. If you didn't have pain signals, you'd keep your finger on a hot stove to the point where it would cause permanent damage. Now, Ronald Malzak and Patrick Wall developed the, the gate control theory which suggests that pain is determined by the opening and closing of psychological gates or neurological gates in the spinal cord. And it's very simple. When the gate is open, the pain signals are going to reach the brain. When the, pain, when the gate is closed, you will not feel as much pain. Now, there's a little bit more to it, but basically sensory neurons are different than other neurons because they don't have dendrites, but rather free nerve endings that extend from the spinal cord to the skin which is why pain is very quick. So in other words, you know, the nerve endings go all the way down to the skin. So when you pinch a nerve, that's what it means. You're getting constant pain going up to the brain. Now, substance P is a neural neurotransmitter for pain, and it stimulates the nerve endings. When it stimulates the nerve endings, because the nerve endings run directly up, you know, through uh, to the spinal cord, you're gonna, the gate's going to become open and you're going to feel the pain. Now, these messages then travel to the thalamus, then to the soma to sensory cortex. Remember, that's located in the parietal lobe. That's what our sensation of touch is coming from. It's also put into the frontal lobes, which basically, that's when we had the interpretation and say it really hurts, because the frontal lobes are putting thought to the process. And the pain signal is also going to the limbic system, which is the emotional side of pain, because that's where the amygdala is located with. Also, because the hippocampus is located in the limbic system, is why you often will remember where you fell, how bad it hurt, and so on. Now, 
kinesthetic sense monitors and coordinates the movement among body parts. The kinesthetic sense allows me to close my eyes and know I'm moving my arm. Okay, kinesthetic sense monitors the fact that my arm is moving right now, even though I don't see it. Okay, now the neurons that basically monitor this movement are called proprioceptors, and they're located in your joints and they communicate information to the brain concerning tension and movement of the body. This sense allows you, like I said, to move your arm without visually seeing it. Now, the vestibular sense monitors balance and head position. Okay? So, in other words, dizziness is coming from the vestibular sense. But this sense receives information from the inner ear, okay? specifically the vestibular sacs and the semicircular canals. These two are comprised of fluid, and the hair cells detect the movement. When the fluid starts moving, okay, basically that's because your head's moving. Now, really, in all actuality, you want that fluid to remain pretty calm or pretty still, and that means your head is still. But if you start turning around and spinning around like you just don't care, what's going to happen is that fluid starts moving back and forth. And when that fluid moves back and forth, it's reporting basically to the brain that your head is moving. Okay? And that's why people grab their head when they're dizzy, because they're trying to keep that fluid in place. Now, good example here, John complains that when he gets out of bed, that he feels dizzy. He also says his ears hurt, which is common. Now, why is John commenting that his ears hurt? As you're kind of reading through this one, I'm just going to kind of go to the answer, because it's kind of a long one. You can see it in your PowerPoint. Information is provided by the inner ear, semicircular canals, and vestibular sacs, which stimulate or assist the vestibular sense in monitoring balance in relation to movement. Okay? Now, perception is our awareness, integration, and organization of sensory information. How we perceive something. This is the brain. Okay, we perceive information that our senses detect. Remember that sensation. Now, we're all a little bit different. Okay. Now, awareness, integration, and organization into meaningful information. We're interpreting our sensory information. That's referred to as, and most of you guessed it, be perception. Now, Bottom-up processing is the organization of information without the use of prior knowledge. Bottom-up processing is simply using our senses, okay? beginning with the individual elements that are structured together to form the whole. Okay? So basically, each part is given attention, and not until individual elements are connected is the whole recognized or identified. This is similar bottom-up processing to putting together a puzzle. By taking different amounts of sensory information, touching something, hearing something, visually seeing it. When you put these pieces together of what you're detecting, you're putting together, so to speak, like a puzzle. And when you get a complete picture of the puzzle, then you're able to identify it. So in other words, bottom-up processing is taking all your sensory information, what you see, what you hear, what you're touching, putting it together, and forming an interpretation. Now, top-down processing is the organization of information that uses prior knowledge to form the whole. In other words, the whole is your interpretation. The final whole is already known, and then the individual elements are identified. So putting together a puzzle by looking at the picture of the box would be an example of top-down processing. So in other words, what you're doing is using prior knowledge of what you see, and then simply identifying. So in other words, you see in your mind a burger, then you identify the parts of the burger. Okay. Now, Armando was tearing up old papers when he realized that he had accidentally torn up the homework that was due the next day. Because Armando knew that his homework was, he was able to put the pieces back together with relative ease. So in other words, he already had his homework done. All right, He's got prior knowledge of his homework. Which one of those bottom-up or top-down processing uses prior knowledge? Okay, And that simply was top-down processing. Okay, I always like to say top, meaning your brain, Okay, to the top of your body. Now, Gestalt psychologists believe that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Now, I'm going to explain that to you. Gestalt psychologists Max Wertheimer and Kurt Kaufick and Wolfgang Kohler believe that perception is based on the integration of individual elements into a whole. Now, Gestalt means organization or whole figure. Often, when we picture something, we picture it as a whole item. So if I said right now, picture a car, you picture that car put together. You're not picturing that car with individual parts. You picture it all as one. So the whole is greater than some of the parts. If you took a car apart, it's going to look different than all the parts scattered all over your driveway. 
Okay, so the whole does look different than the sum of its parts. And again, when we imagine things, we imagine as a whole figure. Now, some Gestalt laws, figure ground is, again, this is how we put things together, all right? how we interpret things. That's your perception. That's a good psychologist study. Figure ground is the ability to distinguish between the figure and the foreground, and the ground is the background. In other words, what that means is we separate the object from the background to make sense of it. So when we look at a wall and we're looking at a picture, our brain basically separates the picture from the background. Now, that's how we interpret things. Now, hunters wear camouflage, so they don't stand out, so they blend in to the background. That way, the animals can't separate them as easily. If you were wearing something that you know, stood out from the background, the animal would pick you up right away and obviously run away. Now, we also have a tendency to group things as whole figures. Remember, the whole is different than the sum of the parts. Now, proximity is we tend to have a tendency to group things close together. So if four or five people are standing close together, we call them a group of people. We don't say, hey, five individuals come here. We say, hey, group, come over here. Okay? That is proximity. Similarity is we tend to group similar objects together to make one whole. This is like the team. So if you got five people wearing orange shirts, you group them as simply not five individuals wearing orange shirts, but one group of people wearing orange shirts. Continuity is the tendency to see an object as continuing despite an obvious break. So in other words, continuity is simply when you look at, for example, an object as continuous, you see the train going down the tracks, you see it you know, continuing in the same direction that you saw it. Closure is our tendency to fill in the missing pieces to complete the object and see it as a whole. If you were looking at a sign, and let's say it said stop, if there was four bulbs burned out on the S, you would still be able to group in your mind the letter S because your mind fills in the gaps, and that's called closure. Common fate is the tendency to see objects that move in the same direction as together. So two cars going down the road in the same direction, we basically group those cars together. Okay? Now, according to the Gestalt principle of proximity, remember proximity is closeness. How do we group objects together? So you're going to look for the word that's close. And right away, most of you have already seen it, and that's in letter B. Objects that are close together are interpreted as being together. Now, another good question. Letitia is listening to her teacher conduct a lesson on the parts and functions of the brain. Letitia can distinguish your teacher from the board because of which Gestalt principle. So which one do you separate the object from the background? Background is the key word there. And most of you right away went down to letter E and figured that one out. And again, that's figure ground. Now, perception of location, distance, and motion. Monocular cues, or monocular cues, information is perceived by one eye. This plays a crucial role in the ability to detect depth perception. Monocular cues are primarily used in the depth perception, in other words, to see in 3D. Now, some of the monocular cues, relative size or area. The size of an object is judged by relative size area of objects that surround the original object. Now, what that means very simply, and I know that's kind of complicated, but the closer an object, the larger it appears. So my hand in front of my face looks very big compared to my hand further away. So the size of an object is determined by how close it is. Right up here it looks bigger. Back here it looks smaller. Inch position is an object that is farther away is partially hid. So I can put my hand right here, put this hand in front of it, and this hand I can tell by simply right here is farther back. Now in a painting that's what artists do. They'll paint something right in front of another object. So here let's say here's a tree and they put the person. From looking at the picture, all right, you can tell the person standing in front of the tree. If the tree was in front and the person was drawn half, like half the person was missing, and you only saw the half, it would look like they're behind the tree. Now, texture gradient or relative clarity is lesser clarity is perceived as being farther away. So in other words, if I had my hand over here, the closer I bring my hand to my face, the more I can tell individual marks on my hand. Farther away, I can't see those marks. So texture gradient is the closer the object, the more we can tell in terms of fine details. Now, motion parallax, the relative motion. This is often, a good way to explain this is, when you're driving in a car, trees that are far away from the freeway, or your car, appear to be basically moving in slow motion. But closer objects, like, you know, let's say this, you know, the mile markers, appear to be whizzing by very quickly. 
So the farther an object away is, the slower it looks like it's moving. So a plane in the sky looks like it's going very slow compared to if it was on the runway in front of your face, it would appear very quickly. Now, for accurate depth perception, okay, we rely on both eyes, binocular depth cues. Now binocular, there's two types of binocular depth cues. Retinal disparity, information is processed by each eye and it's used to form one image. Eyes in different locations of the face, obviously they are, trust me on that. You have one right and one left, are going to see objects differently. Like my finger here, with this eye, looks slightly different if I look at it from this side. So in other words, it looks farther away in this side, and it looks very closer. So to this eye it looks bigger, to this eye it looks smaller apart. But what happens is both eyes fuse that information together and simply form an image. Now, convergence is simply, you have muscles, right? Remember the iris is a muscle, it controls the size of the pupil. If you bring an object very close to your nose and concentrate on it, you feel a strain. So the more strain there is on the eyes, the closer the object is to you, okay? Don't do that too often, you'll get dizzy. Now, which of the following would be most difficult for a person who only had one eye? Inserting a toothpick into a, a horizontal stall, watching a movie at a theater, Correctly identifying the color of a car, organizing objects into similar patterns of colors, understanding that a line continues despite changing it. Now that was a tough question, but information received from each eye are needed for judging the correct depth of objects. So when you look back, inserting a toothpick into a horizontal straw requires you know both eyes. And simply, if one person doesn't, that's going to affect it. Now, perceptual constancies is the ability to see an object as maintaining its original shape, color, or size without having to reinterpret each time a change occurs. Now I'll explain what that means, but some examples are shape, color, brightness, and constancy, as well as size constancy. What that means is, like for example, with shape, if I turn something sideways, it looks different to you because the shape changes. But shape constancy is the no, even though the shape changes, it's still the same object. Like size constancy, you open up a door, it appears to become smaller because simply further away, the smaller it gets. But knowing size constancy, you know that simply that's the same door. Just because it's opening and it appears smaller, it is still the same door. Same with color constancy and brightness constancy. You take something outside, the sun is going to reflect it differently to make it brighter. But you're not going to all of a sudden say, oh, what happened? This looks like a totally different sweater. You're still going to know it's the same sweater. Now, Devin understands that when a door is opening, it does not lose its original shape. And again, what's this known as? Again, the size of the door. When the door opens, it appears smaller. So that, again, is constancy, which more specific would be size constancy. Now, the brain is able to correct for the time delay that is experienced as information travels from the retina to the optic nerve to the visual cortex by filling in the misses pieces. Okay? Now, what this means is, there's ways our brains interpret an apparent motion, even though not actual motion has occurred. So, you have to remember, by the time the information gets to the brain, a lot of times the image is moving, or, or you know, and what the brain does, it allows for that movement and that delay it takes to get to the brain. Now, three things that simply are affected by this. Autokinetic effect is the perception of movement of a stationary point of light in a totally darkened room. The reason for this movement is because the stationary point of light is projected on a featureless, or in other words, there's no background, and your eyes have to point to have no point of reference against the judge. So right here, if I put a dot, because it's projected on the screen, you're using the background on the screen to know that the dot's not moving. But if I turned off the lights and you just saw a red dot, that red dot would appear to be moving slightly because your eye has no way to fixate it or simply hold it on a stationary point of the background. Now, stroboscopic motion is the perception of movement due to the rapid presentation of a, stage, a, a changing stationary image, like a movie. So constantly projecting something onto the eye makes it look like it's going to move. And most of you, you know, probably dancing when there's a, a strobe light, it looks like you're moving in a rear type of direction because it's constantly projected onto your eye. It appears like a type of movement, okay, and it's often very slow. Five phenomenon. This one's always on a test. The apparent movement due to the sequential way that you're presenting the light. What it means is, and this one is kind of tough to explain to you guys without giving you a visual, but sometimes you look at a sign of an arrow and it literally looks like it's pointing you in a direction. 
So by turning on the light bulbs in a certain type of sequential order, in other words, let's say I want to have the arrow pointing this way. If I put the bulbs on and turn them on slowly and then speed them up, as the bulbs are getting turned on, slow and then faster, 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 your eyes are following the bulbs being turned on. It looks like it's movement. It looks like it's pointing you. So a lot of times you go to a ball game and it, you look up at the board and it's like, you know, they hit the ball and it's being projected as the ball traveling outside of the scoreboard. They're just turning on the lights slowly and then quicker and then quicker and you're following how they're turning the lights on. And as your eyes follow that, they're obviously moving with how the bulbs are being turned on. Now, good question. Study subjects were placed in a darkened room and told to focus on a single stationary point. After a few minutes, subjects reported the point light was moving because they only have a background. They turned the lights off. And again, most of you figured this one out right away. D, that's called the autokinetic effect. Now, visual cliff demonstration. This one's always a good test question. Eleanor Gibson and Richard Walk questioned depth perception as either innate or learned. And what they did, a baby was placed on a checkerboard table, which consisted of deep side and a shallow side with plexiglass glass laid across the middle. So in other words, how they did this was they put two tables and they put plexiglass in the middle. Okay, and then they put the baby at one end. And the baby started crawling, but when it got to the plexiglass, it basically looked down and then walked back, or crawled back, I should say. It wasn't walking yet. But it crawled back. It wouldn't go across the plexiglass. And this basically demonstrated that we are born with depth perception. Now, when I say born with depth perception, that would support the evolutionary perspective. We are born, we are born with certain things, right, this is your Darwin, we're born with certain things that enable us to survive, and obviously not crossing over a ravine would be very, you know, key for survival. Now, attention, selective attention is the ability to focus on a task while ignoring other tasks or objects, all right? and that's not too difficult to understand, but a lot of times if you're able to form on my voice, okay, or simply listen to my voice, you're able to tune out everything around you. Now, there's certain terms that go with that. Inattentional blindness is the inability to see objects due to distraction. Our brains determine what to focus on and what to ignore. So in other words, inattentional blindness is you can't filter out the background noise to focus on what you're supposed to. Okay, you're distracted. That's another word for intentional blindness. Multitasking is the ability to focus your attention on two distinctly different tasks. For example, talking on the phone and doing your homework. All right, you're able to do two different things, which isn't always advisable. Now, cocktail party effect, which was on the exam years ago, is the ability to focus on one task while simultaneously focusing on another. Okay, very similar to multitasking. In fact, just an example of it. Well, why it's called cocktail party effect is you're able to talk to somebody in front of you. And you're able to also focus on who's entering the front door to see who's coming into the party. So you're able to maintain a conversation, one task but also look across the room and see who's entering, at, you know, entering the door or who's coming over, okay? Now, the ability to talk to the phone and type on the computer at the same time, you would either look for cocktail party effect or you simply would look for perceptual processing and the answer is selective attention, okay? You're able to focus your attention on one while ruling out all other distractions. Now, that is our last question, so got that done with under an hour. I hope you enjoyed that chapter, and good luck sensing things.